Uh, first of all, welcome to everybody to our today's colloquium, which will be given by Elliot Gilbert from uh, Anstö, Australia. So Elliot is an instrument scientist at the Quokka Small Angle Scattering Instrument at Anstö and also honorary professor at university. And uh, now Quokka is not only the most productive instrument at Anstö, but uh, definitely the one named after the cutest animal. And uh, Elliot has a particular interest in applying neutron scattering for food science, which is a project which he has initiated. And that will be the focus of the talk uh, given today. Um, during the talk, you are free to, to ask questions via the Q&A and we collect them and afterwards we answer them one by one after the presentation. So please, Elliot, it's all yours. Okay. Well, thanks, Uli. Um, so um, what I'm going to do in this presentation is, as Uli described, uh, describe what we've been doing in Australia for the best part of 15 years. And that's really to develop a community of researchers that can benefit from the application of neutron scattering for the study of food materials. Now, I don't think I need to read this. Uh, but um, the white eagle star flaws of neutron scattering are, are stated here. Um, John White was my PhD supervisor. And uh, I would say that based upon reading those laws that a corollary of number two would be that neutron scattering is the most expensive method to not tell the difference between butter and margarine. And I'm hoping that in this presentation, I can convince you that it's not quite as bad as that. So this is an overview of the presentation I'm going to be giving today. I'm going to, first of all, take you through some history of the project. I'm going to describe what food material science is and why we should be looking at food structure. I'm then going to talk about why neutrons particularly uh, represent uh, a useful form of radiation for studying food. And then the last two parts are really how neutron scattering techniques have been applied. I'm going to briefly talk about non small angle neutron scattering techniques, but the vast majority of the applications thus far that I found in the literature have been using small angle and ultra small angle techniques. And I'm going to illustrate the application of these techniques to all classes of macronutrients, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So let me um, just take you through some of the history of this project. So I, um, I joined ANSTO in 2001. I formerly worked at the Intense Pulse Neutron Source at Argonne National Lab. And my, my role going back to Australia was to build a small angle neutron scattering instrument at the newly constructed, or, or actually when I joined, it wasn't even under construction. We didn't have anything there, but, uh, we were in the, but it was the new uh, Australian replacement research reactor, which ultimately became, which was ultimately called OPAL. So in, so in the process of um, designing um, the small angle instrument, which was subsequently called Quokka, we had some discussions about um, you know, the extent to which we were likely to be able to fully subscribe uh, the instrument. I mean, would there be enough interest in the community? We have a number of power user groups in Australia, but even so, there were some questions around what the, you know, what the level of subscription would be. And one idea that we discussed was whether we could develop a new community of researchers that had an until then really used neutron scattering. And those were people who were working in food. Now food is the number one manufacturing industry in Australia. So to some extent, there's some logic to do that. But also if you think about the major components in food, they're basically polymers and water, right? And so small angle scattering is excellent for studying polymers and neutrons are excellent at studying water and hydrogen. And so there's a great deal of logic to that. So I put forward this project, it was approved, and then fortunately I got some money to build the first research group, um, who you can see here. And then we got the operating license for Quokka in 2008. 
So when we think about the grand challenges around food and food material science, I mean, here's a few, and this is not exhaustive, but you know, if you're a food company, you want to try and make food which tastes just like you can cook at home. So that's challenging, and there's a fair amount of food engineering and processing that goes with that. Then health. People want to eat food that's going to make them healthy, do them good. So there are issues there around nutrition and physiology and whether components which are added to food are actually bioavailable. You know, can you actually integrate them? Can you use them? Then variability in raw materials, a major challenge. If you're a food company and you get your ingredients from different regions of the country, then they may not behave in exactly the same way. So if you want to produce a product which is consistent and constant, it tastes the same in June and December, then you have to have a good understanding of how your ingredients behave. Then another question is around the efficient use of raw materials and can one make better use of waste streams to make new products? Then there's performance. Food, we expect to break down in a particular way. We expect some foods to be crunchy, some foods to be soft, and that's just in the mouth. There are other questions around how food breaks down in the gastrointestinal tract. And then, of course, there's also quality. How are things taste, how are things uh, textured. And there's quite a lot of work that goes into trying to put scientific measures around these attributes, which in many ways are somewhat subjective in nature. Indeed, the food industry play, pays a lot of money every year to train consumer panels where they respond to particular new foods and you know whether they're likely to buy them or not. So the big challenges cover engineering, chemistry, physics, biology, nutrition, physiology, and so on. Now, what we're really good at doing um, with neutron scattering is measuring things. And food is hierarchical in nature. It has structure on the nano scale, on the micro scale, on the supramolecular length scale, and so on. And then here's a variety of structures that you would find in common foods. And you can see it just transcends a wide range of length scales. And now equally well, there are time scales. So it could be that we are interested in how stable our emulsion is going to be on the supermarket shelf. Or it could be that as a food manufacturer, we're interested in how particular ingredients respond when they're exposed to low levels of moisture and whether they undergo a glass transition. So they change their state from, from a glassy state, easy to handle, to maybe a more rubbery state. So let me just give you a very simple example of that. Here are some potato crisps or chips as they call them in Australia. And we expect them to be crunchy. And the major ingredient here is starch. Well, another food which has a major ingredient of starch is pasta. Now we don't expect pasta to be crunchy. I mean, if it is, it's undercooked. And in fact, you know, we're, we're familiar with the concept of al dente pasta. And the al dente is really what happens when there's sufficient moisture in the outside of the pasta to make it rubbery, but not enough on the inside to make it rubbery. It's actually slightly glassy. And this is all to do with moisture, mobility, and enabling water to plasticize the polymer. So there's a great deal that we can study here with neutrons, both from the perspective of water, but also from the perspective of time scales. So what makes neutrons so special for looking at food? Well, you've seen these graphs before, so we can play the games of solvent contrast variation or with, um, with changing hydrogen to deuterium. It doesn't have to be aqueous systems. I'm going to give you an example, which is oil-based. We can also do um, selective deuteration, like we do at the National Deuteration Facility that we have at ANSTO. And of course, we can also observe a whole range of timescales using neutron scattering. 
Okay, so I told you that the food project started before Quokka was operational. And so naturally, the first experiments we did required me to be a suitcase scientist, something that I did pretty much during my entire PhD. Here is some data which was collected on the SAD instrument at the Intense Pulse Neutron Source in um, at Argonne National Lab. And it shows four small angle neutron scattering patterns plus a small angle X-ray scattering pattern. And here we were trying to understand the structure of starch, which had undergone hydrolysis to produce what's called resistant starch. And I will explain later on what I mean by resistant starch, but this is simultaneously defined, um, simultaneously refined data. All the data sets here have been fitted to a single model. Here is some also some older data now. This was collected on the V3 NEAT instrument at the Helmholtz Center Berlin. And it concerns um, the uh, dynamics of this protein here called soy glycinin. It's a 360 kilodalton hexameric protein. Um, glycinin is composed of five subunits, but only one of those, when we were looking at this, had been crystallized. And we were interested in just exploring the protein dynamics at low levels of moisture. And again, the application here is for the purposes of how one can handle this ingredient in as part of a, a larger food formulation. So we did these experiments um, where we hydrated with H2O or D2O at different levels of moisture. And in summary, what we found is that this protein exhibits the onset of anharmonicity at around about 230 Kelvin, just like you see for a whole range of much simpler proteins. But I do remember when we published this, one of the reviews, reviewers' comments were, why did we bother even looking at this protein given it was such a mess? But that's the thing about industrial systems. They are mixed. This, this is composed of multiple subunits. A little bit after that, we started, um, well, it started as a workshop, but it's now become a conference series, Neutrons and Food. We, we held the first conference in um, Sydney in 2010, um, which was also, um, later on, we featured some stories on the front cover of Neutron News. And this conference has been held every two years. Um, in fact, up until recently, we, we hope to have a conference in Japan actually next month. And unfortunately that's been postponed, but um, we hope next year we'll have the opportunity to meet in Japan. But at the last Neutrons and Food Conference, we um, had a series of abstracts which used the techniques which I've shown here. So you can see that the vast majority were, were small angle neutron scattering and ultra small angle neutron scattering. And therefore that's a bulk of the presentation today. But we've got some examples here from other techniques. So just let just me give you a few examples of where neutron scattering has been used. Now this first example um, is from a group in Sweden and, and some of the data here comes from um, from the IOL. And this concerns what happens um, when one uses these fluorinated polymers, which are used uh, as nonstick coatings on pans and cookware, but also on the surface of various packaging material. And there were some um, safety concerns around the, around the, the aspect of bioaccumulation. So what this group did using neutron reflectometry is that they studied both these fluorinated polymers and partly fluorinated polymers, and also investigated the effect of chain length on the extent to which the polymers would enter a lipid bilayer. And they found that the fluorinated polymers actually did in, did in fact displace lipids in the bilayer, but the partially fluorinated ones really didn't do that. So that was very useful information to have. Here's an example using neutron diffraction. Now, this is from our high intensity powder diffractometer, Wombat, and it's looking at the triglyceride, the fat tripalmatin. 
And here the researchers were interested in what happens to the um, crystal structure and the extent of crystallization under shear. So actually this experiment done, was done with a Kuwait shear cell um, in, the, um, in the sample position of Wombat. Now here's an example using quasi-elastic neutron scattering, although this system was also being studied with um, spin echo sands. And it is a calcium caseinate system, which when it undergoes shear and a little bit of heat, it forms these fibrous structures. And these fibrous structures are of potential interest for making vegetarian meats. Um, in these particular experiments, uh, the, the group were using um, quasi-elastic neutron scattering to study the reorientational dynamics of the caseinate protein. And they were looking at the influence of temperature, um, but also specifically the method of manufacture, whether it's spray drying and roller drying. And they were able to distinguish and make some recommendations there about the appropriateness of each of the manufacturing methods. And uh, just finally then some neutron radiography. Um, so this is from a review article, many of these. Um, so neutron radiography has been used to look at the internal structure of cork, which is obviously important in the wine industry. It's been used to look at various drying methods. So this is um, macro here. Um, comparing both freeze drying and conventional drying. And then here are um, corn kernels, um, again, looking at different, uh, different drying methods. And then this is some data which um, we collected on the Dingo neutron radiography beamline. Um, and this is looking inside a small scale um, food process. Um, I will talk more about this a little bit later on, but this, these um, images were taken inside a rapid visco analyzer. Most of the um, results I'm going to be showing today have been collected on Quokka. Um, and you will recall that I said at the beginning that there were questions around the, the level of subscription to the beamline. Um, it turns out that we perhaps needn't have worried because um, our subscription rates are so high on Quokka that we had to build a second instrument. And that's, a, that's shown here, the time of flight sense instrument Bilby, which, which very much uh, is in the spirit of D33. Now this is Quokka here. Um, we obviously don't just study food on Quokka. We, you know, we do all the good small angle neutrons, neutron scattering stuff like colloids and polymers and Here's some magnetism here, and here are some skirmions. Um, it's 20 meters upstream, 20 meters downstream. Uh, we have um, instant beam polarization and um, polarization analysis, um, focusing optics. So it's all, I would say, all quite conventional. Um, one thing we have done um, in the last couple of years, though, that I thought was worth mentioning for this audience is that we've replaced our 21,000N Ordella detector with a new detector, which we, um, we purchased through a well, part of a collaboration agreement with Brookhaven National Lab. Now, prior to this detector, we had to over collimate our beam um, just to enable our count rates to be manageable. So we were limited to 50 kilohertz globally and 40, 40 hertz per pixel. The, the Brookhaven National Lab detector um, provided, um, it works in ionization mode as opposed to multiplication mode. And um, so it's still helium-3 technology. It's composed of a four by four array of these, um, of pad boards. And one of these pad boards is shown here. And each of these pad boards consists of 48 by 48 pads or pixels or five millimeter in size. And then an array of eight by eight of these pixels get fed into an application specific integrated circuit, really designed for low noise with a preamp on there. And so we're able to get 
very, very high count rates, um, you know, stunningly so. Um, you can see here that we've been able to go in excess of two megahertz. And on a per pixel basis, we've, we've gone to 12 kilohertz. Um, and just to, just to show you some data, this is nothing to do with food. This is a scattering from a hydrogenated deuterated polymer blend. One second of data um, with the beam over collimated uh, with the Ordella detector. And here is one second worth of data displaced for, to, just to show you can see it, so you can see it more easily. And you can see we can get really high quality data in a second here. And um, we've pushed up to 5.9 megahertz so far. And I think we can do better than that. Okay, so let me move to the um, main focus of my talk, which is food and small angle neutron scattering. And the first um, set of examples I want to give you are from the macronutrient class of carbohydrates. And I'm going to be talking specifically on starch. Now, starch is formed in higher plants in the form of granules, which have a, a size range of one to several hundred nanometers. Um, going down in size, they have um, a whole series of growth rings, which have a substructure, which in turn have a substructure. And this substructure here, this array alternating lamella arrangement, arises from the local packing of the two polymers forming starch myelopectin, a branch polymer, and amylose, a unbranched polymer. So even, even you, know, you might think of starch as being a single ingredient. Actually, it's really a polymer blend. And it's this alternating lamella arrangement which gives rise to the peak that we see in the small angle region. This corresponds to a despacing of about nine nanometers. Now, these three patterns were collected on quokka, and they've all been collected from cornstarch or maize starch. So the point I want to make here is even, even for something which is supposedly a single ingredient, and even for something which is supposedly from a single variety, if you will, corn, they all have quite different scattering patterns. And so we can get quite nice information using small angle scattering here about the polymer organization, not only along the polymer axis, but also laterally, which you can see here. So in this, um, in the high amylo starch, we get what's called a um, an interhelix peak, which arises from this spacing here, which is only seen in starches which exhibit high amylos, or they've been extracted from starches from tubers. I got into this um, through my interest in resistant starch. And resistant starch is a component of starch which doesn't get digested until it reaches a large intestine. So we, we consume starch, we, there's some digestion that takes place in the mouth. There's a whole lot of digestion that takes place in the small intestine as well. But the component that doesn't get digested reaches a large intestine and there it acts as a fermentable substrate for gut bacteria. And there the bacteria produce short chain fatty acids, which have been shown to cause apoptosis or programmed cell death in colorectal cancer cells. And this is the most deadly non-gender specific cancer behind lung cancer. And Australia rates number three in the world. And it's thought to be due to the consumption of a highly refined diet. So my interest has been to look at ways of maximizing resistant starch. And that's been looking at the polymer composition. It's been looking at processing, for example, extrusion, the influence of cooking and storage and so on. And in the last um, 10, 15 years or so, we've published about 30 papers in this area. Here's an example which is starch digestion, but looking at it from a slightly different perspective. This is some work that I've done with colleagues at the University of Auckland. And here they've been digesting starch with this enzyme or myeloglucosidase to deliberately produce porous starch. And the idea here is that this, um, this porous material can act as a, a storage vehicle, a, an encapsulant for bacteria, could be flavors, could be drug components. 
um, it could reduce the oxidation rate of olive oil. So with small angle x-ray, this is x-ray scattering, but you could do this with neutron scattering. You can see the lamella peak here. As the process of digestion uh, proceeds, the intensity increases at low angle, and that arises because we're increasing the surface area of the pores, or, or, or of the starch granules, I should say. And then if you do the experiment with u sands, you can see that this shoulder here shifts to gradually lower and lower Q. And that tells us about the average dimension of the pores. Now you'd say, well, okay, but can't you just do that with electron microscopy? And of course you can, but the advantage of u sands is that because we're using such large beams, we can interrogate statistically a very, very large number of granules. So that, pr that provides us with very useful complementary information. Here's some uh, work which I did with um, collaborators at the Spanish Research Agency uh, in food, and they were also looking at porous starches. This is an enzyme um, causing the digestion called CGTase. And here, the, when the starch is digested, it produces cyclodextrins. And we were able to show that the mode of um, hydrolysis is quite different in corn starches compared to potato starches. And, and this just shows the kinetics uh, the, of the digestion process in real time using an in situ digestion chamber. Much of the food we eat is being processed in some way. And uh, this um, example is from the rapid visco analyzer that I mentioned a short time ago. So I came across this device, uh, which is widely used in the food industry as a quality assurance tool for following, uh, let's say, pasting properties or flow behavior in food. And the principle is as follows. You, you take a, a can and you put your food material in there. So we're gonna be talking about starch. So we take our starch, we add some water, and we put this plastic paddle in into the can. And then we take the can and we put it inside this unit. And that unit contains a heating block. So now we can, we can heat the material so we can cook it. And then we measure the change in torque on the impeller as the starch is being cooked. And so we can follow the, the flow behavior. So here's a temperature profile. So room temperature increases, it plateaus and comes down. And then this is the RVA profile, which is basically like a viscosity curve. So it's flat and increases, and it increases because the granules will take on water and also the granules will leach amylose and that also increases the viscosity. Then the granules disintegrate, they break down and the viscosity decreases. And then as we lower the temperature, the, the gel that we've produced as a result of the cooking of the starch firms up and then we have this region called setback. So fine, that's all very well. And the, and the industry uses this and they like to see these signatures because they can then mix and match ingredients to replicate this profile and they know their food process is gonna behave in the correct way. However, my thoughts were, would it be interesting to understand what's happening to the structure in real time as a food process is taking place? So I approached the company and they were sufficiently interested that they donated a rapid visco analyzer to the project. So we took the RVA, the, the, the one they donated didn't have this cover on it. So we, we had access to the heating block. We punched a hole through the heating block so we could get the neutron beam through because neutrons are penetrating, but not so penetrating. And then we replaced the plastic paddle with an aluminium paddle, which was handmade by a craftsman who also handmade a replica of the America's Cup. So, you know, this was, this is really artistic rather than mathematic, I would say. We subsequently changed the paddle for a titanium one also, because that's, that's also neutron transparent. But to avoid multiple scattering, we had this little kind of cylindrical section here, which is hollowed out. 
So the idea is that we interrogate the starch that appears on the outside of the paddle and on the inside of the can. So there's about a millimeter of material on either side of the paddle that the, the beam goes through. So hopefully it'll be a bit clearer here. Here is the RVA on the quarker beam line, neutrons from the, from the right going into the left. I've shown the paddle deliberately exposed here, but in reality, it's down sitting at the, um, sitting at the um, sample position. This was actually reported in the Australian Financial Review, which is um, you know, the Australian equivalent of the Wall Street Journal. And it turned out that the story was reported on the same day as, a board, as our, um, the Anstow board were meeting. So that was made a number of people quite happy. So here, here's now some data, um, the RVA profile, which I talked about before. And each one of these is one minute, one minute of SANS data. And on the right here, I've shown the sands in a, in a conventional way. So all of you now know what this peak is due to. Um, and you'll see that after about four minutes, this peak disappears and the intensity increases dramatically at low Q. Also note that four minutes also happens to be where the viscosity takes off. So what's going on? Well, here are five more data sets now from different starches. And we can fit the data and it's really straightforward. So we fit this to a lamella system. Here's a Bragg peak. The intensity at low Q has a slope of Q minus two, which is consistent with a lamella structure. And then on, on heating and after four minutes, we get a gel. And although this, I know this is not particularly featured, it is um, after all small angle neutron scattering, um, we can fit the data with a model which is completely suitable for a gel, what's called a Texera model. And from the characteristics of this fit, we can say something about the fractal nature of the gel and the substructure of the gels, which also depends on the um, polymer composition. Now, there was some work done prior um, which you, which was done at a synchrotron um, using a Kuwait cell. And a model was proposed, which was based upon um, a cylindrical structures. And we tried that model and the model does fit. However, it, it um, is out by one order of magnitude if you take into account the amount of material in your sample. And that's the advantage of neutron scattering that is, is not only qualitative, it is quantitative. So we were able quite directly to exclude that model. Now, where I think the opportunity is for the food industry is being able to study things in operando. So being able to really identify what's happening to a structure in real time. Can one increase the throughput, lower the energy and still get the same quality product? Um, now, at this point, I want to do a quick detour because I said that in this experiment, we collected the data in one minute time intervals. So we had to sort of decide up front how we were going to collect the data. And this was all done before we got event mode acquisition, um, really going in a routine way on Quokka. But if I was doing this experiment now, I would do it with event mode acquisition. And, and, and we've done that uh, as an example for this, um, for this um, D differential scanning calorimetry unit, which to my knowledge is the only DSC in the world capable of enabling the simultaneous measurement of small angle neutron scattering. Although I know in the last year or so, ISIS have got a DSC unit operating for doing quasi-elastic neutron scattering. But um, the point I wanna make here is that with event mode acquisition, you know, you can bin your data as you wish post-experimentally. And that's what we did here, going through multiple endotherms um, for this binary um, hydrogenated deuterated paraffin blend. And also completely unrelated to the food, but just because I, I am quite passionate about designing and implementing unique sample environments, this is a sample environment that was made to rapidly heat and core a sample in the beam called a rapid heat quench cell. 
and um, I'm hoping that um, this video will work and um, you just see how fast it is. So this is, um, I think the frame, I think it's about 130, 130 of a frame a second. And um, you can just see that um, the sample moves very quickly into the beam. So you can choose whether the reservoir here is hot or cold. And this is able to do um, heating or cooling about 10 to 20 degrees a second between 150 Kelvin and 600 Kelvin. Right, so let me move to my second example now, and it relates to lipids. Now, in the in the category of lipids, you've got triglycerides, diglycerides, monoglycerides, fatty acids, steroids, um, which includes vitamin D, by the way. I'm going to primarily be talking about triglycerides and fatty acids. And they are used widely in food products to provide um, texture, mouthfeel, um, and, and that's because the fat crystal networks are what provide the, the fundamental structure in the food, where it's margarine or butter, and you know that the, the, the concept of chocolate melting in the mouth, that's deliberate because the, the triglycerides in there are chosen to mount to uh, melt at body temperature. So if we think about triglycerides, which are basically it's a glycerol backbone with three fatty acids, we can categorize those in terms of being oils or fats. So oils, liquid at room temperature, fats, solid at room temperature. The ones which are solid at room temperature tend to be based upon saturated fatty acids, and they tend to be ones which are extracted from um, animal products, whereas those which are liquid at room temperature are oils, and they tend to be plant-based. Now, if you're a food manufacturer and you want to provide texture, mouthfeel to a product, or you may need some kind of hard fat in order to make um, a bakery product, for example, or a pastry, how do you do this without using saturated fats because saturated fats have been implicated in causing a whole range of diet related diseases well one way you can do that is to produce what are called trans fats and that's done through a process of hydrogenation where you take a polyunsaturated fat and you hydrogenate it so that by making it trans, you now make the packing more efficient and therefore the increase in melting point. And that's been done. And there's a whole range of products on the market or there have been, which uses trans fats. However, the problem is it's been shown that trans fats are even worse for one's health than saturated fats. And in fact, um, they've been banned in the US and as of April of this year, there is a legal limit of 2% um, for products which are sold in the European Union. So then, how do you structure without using saturated fats? Well, one way of doing this is to use a process called oleogelation. And that's taking some molecules, adding them to oil in such a way that they spontaneously form a gel. So this was some work that I did with Unilever a number of years ago where they took um, gamma arisenol from rice bran oil and they mixed it with a whole series of phytosterols or plant-based sterols. This one in this, in this case, beta cytosterol, and it forms a gel. And they had some more angle x-ray scattering data and they were able to show that the structure uh, which was forming the network was basically tubular in nature, but it didn't, quite they couldn't quite fit their data fully so what we did was um, performed a whole series of experiments using mixtures of sunflower oil and also deuterated decane to manipulate the contrast and we were able to show that the that there were indeed tubular structures but the data could be fitted with a core shell shell model oil on the inside oil on the outside where these two different shells arise from the slightly different lengths 
of the two components. This additional shell here arises from the, this ferulic acid group on the gamma horizonal. And the real advantage here for this formulation is not only are you not needing to produce use saturated fats, but phytosterols have independently been shown to reduce cholesterol. So that's a, a double benefit. Um, I then moved on to this collaboration, which was a group from Wageningen, and um, they had a different system for forming oleogel. So they took mixtures of oleic acid and sodium oleate. So this is very much fat loving, lipophilic, this not at all. And if you take a mixture of oleic, oleic acid and sodium oleate, 1% of water, you get these gels. And here's some electron microscopy. Um, sorry, optical microscopy here. Again, the question is, what's going on? How, is, how, is, how, is, how are these molecules structuring the oil? Well, here is some um, data now, not collected on Quokka. This was collected on the PUS instrument, uh, LLB, at a time when our, our cold source wasn't operating, so we couldn't do the experiment on Quokka. And um, here we have... Um, different um, ratios of oleic acid to sodium oleate. So two lots of sodium, two lots of oleic acid, one of sodium oleate. So we've got two to one, one to one, one to two, zero to one. That's a pure sodium oleate system. And I've also labeled on here what the gels look like, or, or in fact, whether they form a gel or not. So we get a transparent liquid here, semi-opaque runny liquid, runny gel, and a firm opaque gel here four different scattering patterns, different gel behavior, what's going on? Well, we can fit the data here in a very straightforward way to inverse micelles, water on the inside, the structurant here, oil on the outside. For the pure sodium oleate system, we get a whole series of Bragg diffraction peaks, which we can index based upon sodium oleate. We have an intermediate Q region here with a power law, which is Q to the minus four, ish and another one which is q to the minus two ish at lower q i'll talk about that more in a moment um couldn't really fit the one to two data so it's a bit more complicated but the one to one data here we've got three contrasts we've got um the oil hydrogenated the water deuterated or the oil deuterated and the water hydrogenated or both and we've simultaneously fitted the three data sets to a global model. And here is just fitted with this um, Q minus four fall off plus inverse micelles. So we, we understood a, a good amount about the system, but there was still a lot more to understand. So here is some uh, more recent data now. This has been just recently submitted. And here we're looking at the gel behavior. So we've got the complex modulus here, which is the square root of the storage squared and loss squared moduli square rooted and it's in three different oils sunflower oil medium chain triglyceride and olive oil and you can see the viscosity increases so the complex modulus increases with sodium oleate content but and this is where it gets really interesting oleic, oleic acid has an effect. So here we've produced um, the gels using 16 weight structurant, 8 weight percent structurant, 4 weight percent structurant. And I wanted to show you these two here. So, so this is a, an 8 weight percent pure sodium oleate system. And this is a 16 weight percent equimolar system. So both of these contain the same amount of oleic acid. And you can see that the complex modulus decreases even with the same amount of sodium oleate, adding oleic acid weakens the gel. It happens also there and it happens there. So can we get more information using small angle neutron scattering? Well, here is some data now on Quokka. And you can see that the intensity at low Q increases. And if we plot the intensity at low Q, we find that we get the same effect. So adding oleic acid actually reduces this intensity. What we think is going on here, um, 
arises from this phase diagram, which was ported 20 years ago. And it basically says that if you add sod um, oleic acid to sodium oleate, you get a mixed phase. Now there's a whole series of eutectics here and, and what Tandon et al showed that there was a they would get a, um, a complex, an equimolar complex. Now I have to say, we don't see any complex formation in the quokka data. What we do see evidence of is of, um, of a mixed phase. However, of course, it's important to say that the phase diagram only tells us what's going on in the binary system. It doesn't tell us what happens when we add water to the system or oil to the system. But what we think is going on is that when we add ole oleic acid, we're actually removing crystalline sodium oleate from the system and reducing its ability to form the network. Now, if we combine the data we collected on Quokka with the USANS data that we can collect on Kookaburra, we can get a much better idea of what's going on. So I said, we have a whole series of Bragg diffraction peaks at high Q, which we can um, index to either the pure phase or the mixed phase as appropriate. So we're getting Bragg diffraction from a lamella structure. Then we have this region here, which is not quite Q minus four, it's more minus 3.8, which indicates rough crystalline interfaces. And, um, oh, I should also say that from the, from the, from the, um, the width of the peaks, we can all get, also get some information about the, the extent of the crystals. And then on a larger length scale, lower Q, we get a slope of Q to the minus 2.4. And in fact, there may actually be even an additional slope here at much lower Q. And we could even benefit from going to much, much lower angle. But this is a, a signal now of this, of a mass fractal structure being formed. Now we can't quite overlap with the optical microscopy, but we've got a pretty good idea now, I think of what's going on in this system at, at, on multiple length scales. And you can see this covers 10 orders of magnitude in intensity and five orders of magnitude in Q. Um, emulsions um, are ubiquitous in the food industry. So whether we're stabilizing oil in water or water in oil, we can do that by using surfactants. We can do it by using proteins or we can do it using particles. And um, an example of this would be um, egg yolk granules for stabilizing mayonnaise. These emulsions are called pickering emulsions if they're stabilized by, by particles. An example of, of where we've uh, made pickering emulsions is some work that was done with my collaborators at Massey University in New Zealand. And they were using whey protein from milk. And um, by lowering the pH, they were able to form whey protein gels, which they mixed together th with oil to form an emulsion and to produce these primary emulsion droplets, which you can study with SANS and USANS. And then if you take these primary emulsion droplets and you then take more oil and mix them together more vigorously, you can stabilize larger emulsion droplets with these primary emulsions. So, so this, these are the large droplets now, and here are the primary emulsion droplets decorating this surface. This is electron microscopy. This is confocal laser scanning microscopy where the oil is stained in red and the protein in the protein in green. And by doing ultra small angle neutron scattering here, we are able to um, gain some information about the distribution and arrangement of droplets in the interface here. And that featured on the front cover of Langmuir last year. Now I wanna just give to, go to the final example now very quickly. Um, and it concerns proteins. I'm, I'm really going to be talking um, here about dairy proteins. Now, milk is composed of casein micelles. Um, so casein is present in the form of alpha S1, alpha S2, beta casein, stabilized by calcium phosphate nanoparticles in these micelles. And then the surface is in turn stabilized by a layer of kappa casein. Now, if we disturb this interface either through acid or it could be through the addition of an enzyme, we can cause the KC micelles to collapse together 
and this is the basis of forming cheese and yogurt. Well, my colleagues were interested in um, alternatives to animal rennet, which um, in the context of having vegetarian friendly cheeses, although in most cases now the rennet used for cheese, I'm not sure if it's true in France, but broadly um, microbial rennet is used. But nonetheless, um, they extracted a pro protease from tamarillo fruit, which they called tamarillin, and they were interested in the structure of these dairy systems um, using this protease compared to rennet. And they were able to show that the gels which were formed were somewhat more dense in the case of rennet. But if you do ultra small angle neutron scattering, the larger scale structure is pretty much independent of the protease which is used. And um, here again is this example from the meat analog. So these are these cal calcium caseinate fibril structures which have undergone shear. So this is data collected on um, quokka here. And the data here, they were able to um, identify uh, the size and the shape of the caseinate protein, which is the same independent of orientation. But the larger scale structure here you can see is quite different. And this provides details of the orientational distribution of the fibril network. And finally, here is an example from some quinoa gels where we were investigating the effect of um, salt and salt concentration. And the USANS here gives us information about the larger scale structure in these protein gels. So that's um, really covers what I want to talk about today. So I hope that I've given you a, a good understanding of why studying food is worthwhile, why neutrons are really, um, neutrons are a really good probe for studying food structure. And I hope that I've given you a, a suitable range of examples to, to demonstrate that. If this is of an interest um, to you, then um, I just wanna just uh, uh, suggest a couple of um, short articles for reading. Um, this was published a couple of years ago. That, that really covered the, the former three years of um, small angle scattering, not only neutron, but X-ray as well for looking at food colloids. And here is a, an older paper now, I still think quite useful, um, describing neutron scattering more broadly for food. So here, um, here are the people I'd like to acknowledge. Obviously, I don't do all this by myself. There's a large number of people that I've worked with over the years. Um, the, the people in red, they're the, the, the examples that I've spoken about in most detail. But um, I also want to acknowledge my postdocs over the years and they shown over here. And um, with that, uh, I'm just going to like to thank you for your attention and um, some more details of the, the project can be found here. And um, I can be found on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn as well. And um, I'll stop there. And thank you. Okay, so thanks a lot for this nice presentation. Um, now we look for the questions. So the first question is not a question, it's a comment. Oh, okay. I have a comment on your comment about quantitative aspect of neutron scattering. X-ray scattering is also equally quantitative and cover much broader Q scales. Okay. Um, it cover, I, I'm not sure I would agree that it covers broader range of um, length scales. Um, and as far as quantitative small angle X-ray scattering is concerned, yes, that's absolutely right. One can do small angle X-ray scattering in a quantitative way. However, most of the time it isn't. And most of the time, um, I'm not too sure why it isn't done more, more routinely. I mean, we we do it we do it semi routinely even on our lab based sax instrument, um, and it does require effort in having appropriate standards and dealing with um, some problems around variations in the transmission of different 
capillaries, for example. But I would say that absolute intensity is something that we're doing with small angle neutron scattering um, all the time, all the time. And um, with small angle X-ray scattering, I mean, as I say, there are examples, but I, I don't see them nearly as often as I do for neutrons. Okay. Then I have a question. Uh, in the beginning, you showed the different requests um, of different neutron techniques to cover neutron science. Uh, to cover okay. food science. And the share for USANs was about the same as for SANs. So does this mean that people want to study the same samples with Kukabura and Quaka to cover a wider length scale range? Or are those different samples which are dealt with in different proposals, different No, 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 but I mean, the, I, I think maybe there are, I think there are very few examples I can think of where we have studied a food system with USANs that we haven't also studied with SANs. So typically it's the other way around. People, people want the SANs and then we tell them prior to submitting the proposal, well, you know, your material is hierarchical in nature there's likely to be information that we can get on even larger length scales, and they apply for the USANs time as well. The, the, the relative numbers um, in the Neutrons and Food Conference, I think was because we did have some examples where people used USANs and CSANs but didn't use SANS. So I think that why it looks like the, the proportions look like there's more use SANS than SANS. But from the perspective of what's taking place at ANSTO, it's SANS and usually use SANS as well. Okay, so uh, I see no other question. I'm, by magic, please let me come back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks Elliot, that was a great talk. Uh, you mentioned Unilever, and I can imagine there's a lot of industry interest in the in the work you're doing. So, can you say a bit more about that? I mean, do you have a number of collaborations, or is the proprietary beam time and and so on? Yeah, so we have a number of industrial collaborators. Um, the ones I've presented. Um, so the so the Unilever one's been published, we, but we have some other material that we've done on a fee for service basis that we don't talk about. Mm. Um, and so the it, it's kind of like uh, I would say it's probably like a 60 40 split of what comes in as um, non proprietary. Um, with the aim of being published in the open literature mm -hmm. and the other 40%, which is fee for service. Um, and, and that, by the way, isn't just neutron, that's X-ray as well. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a ballpark figure for the number of companies who are, uh, I think you only mentioned Unilever or that was the one I heard, I know. Well, um, so uh, I'd say, Eight, I'd say eight. Okay. Great. Oh, that's interesting. It's uh... so there's, there's some there's some very big ones in there, and there's some much smaller ones. As you mm -hmm. might imagine, in uh, you know Australia, and New Zealand, you get some smaller kind of more more arti artisanal um, SMEs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Good. No, it's very good if they start doing research of this kind as well. I mean, the big companies, you sort of expect it, but the uh, smaller companies often don't have the resources to, to sort of to do this kind of research. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe something in the same direction. I mean, this is a success story of active targeting of a new community for neutron techniques. Now, with your expertise, which you have now for over a decade, how would you recommend to a colleague who wants to target a new community, like uh, whatever mining industry in Australia or any other community which is underusing neutrons nowadays? What is the main 
uh, thing you have to do to get them involved. You have to do simply experiments and publish in their journals, or you have to go to their fairs, or you have to invite them to do some scientific experiments before getting them on board for the proprietary experiment, or what are the main tools which you use to make to build up such a successful collaboration? Well, that, that is a very difficult question to answer. Um, I, I would say that um, to some extent, some of, the, some of the critical ingredients or components are also true of any collaboration, which is uh, you know, when you go and meet someone at a conference and you're interested in the research they do, and you think you've got something to provide or value add, it doesn't necessarily happen immediately. Right, you have to, um, you know, you have to feel that you can work with somebody. You have to have some trust in the relationship. Um, that that sometimes there has to be that magic of having some resources available because sometimes some money needs to be spent, and often that decision isn't made by the person you're talking to. It's made by somebody higher up in the company. So that that's true of that's true of industry or or you know university research. Um, I guess the other part of it, the other bit of advice I would give is you've got to identify who are the people who are doing really good science in the area that you want to target. You don't want to be just working with anybody, um, and you want to find out if you if you can find those people. You want to find out what are their long term objectives. You don't want to put the effort in to engage with a, a collaborator only to find out that their, their objectives change after a year, because you would have put a whole lot of effort and time into learning their area. You may have even built some specialized sample environment and then find the interest is gone. So I think, yeah, I think that those, those, that's, the, that's the advice I would give. I mean, when we started the, the program in Australia, I, I looked for the really good people doing food material science. And I wanted to find out what were their big problems. And then I tried to think about where neutron scattering could map onto those objectives. I didn't try and convince them to do, to do research I thought they should be doing. That's a mistake, I think. Uh, again, about the, 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 the food user community, is there a demand to, to, to combine science and, and nuisance with other techniques like uh, imaging or diffraction or? Yes. So, so, all, so I think every example I presented, we have complementary data from other characterization techniques. Um, very often, very often it's electron microscopy or confocal scanning, confocal laser scanning microscopy. For the starch work, we do a very large amount of X-ray diffraction. Um, we um, do quite a lot of NMR, both proton NMR and 13 carbon NMR. Um, and infrared spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy, they tend to be quite common. But it's, it's what I said at the beginning, that when you have an incredibly complicated system, both in terms of structure, so length scale and time scale, you have to just throw, throw techniques at the problem. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've, we've not answered any question we're using neutron scattering alone. I, in fact, I don't think you can. Okay, so right now I don't see other questions in the Q&A. So let me thank again Elliot because now it's getting late in uh, Australia. And uh, I will make an announcement of the next colloquium. So after this great talk from the other side of the globe, about industrial applications of neutron science and complementary of Saxon plants and so on. Our next speaker comes just from the other side of the Avenue de Martyr and will tell us about an industrial spin-off of ILL. And that is Peter Hörhoy, 
from the Xenox company who will speak on the this Friday in the ESF ILL colloquium. So latest then see you all back. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, Yuri. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon. Evening. <laughs>